Hi, I'm Shreya and this is Imagined Tomorrow. And you are listening to the third and final part of our mini-series on homes and climate change. This episode is an Imagined Tomorrow short, where we will take a detour and go into the archives of our history. It's a story that I first came across in Amitav Ghosh's Great Derangement. It's a brilliant book that you should all read if you can. There was one story in it that particularly stayed with me, especially because it's based in Bengal and my parents who live there hadn't heard of it. And so I went looking for more information and found some very fascinating history. So part three is that story, one that should serve as a warning about what happens when you dismiss well-reasoned concerns about the climate. Picture this. It's the early 1850s. One of the first Indian ports that the British set up, the Calcutta port on River Hooghly, is now a bustling trade centre. Ships of various sizes, their masts fluttering in the wind, sail in and out of the port every day. But there are growing murmurs of worry. First, Hooghly is getting overcrowded, some say. There are too many ships sailing in these days and the river is running out of space. Second, merchant ships are getting bigger in size and capacity, but the Hooghly is not deep enough to accommodate them all. And last, the river is showing signs of silting up, so its depth is decreasing. And it seems that more and more ships have to remain grounded at arrival and departure until the tide rises and the water is high enough for them to set sail again. There are concerns that soon, Hooghly won't be able to handle the ship traffic that's been assigned to it. So, the British come up with a plan. They decide that they will build a second port. And along with it, a port township. This time, they turned their attention to River Matla in the Sundarbans, about 45 kilometres to the southeast of Calcutta. Matla seems to have many advantages. Hooghly, a distributary of River Ganga, is more than 200 kilometres away from the sea. So ships have to do a long, delicate dance of navigation to get to the port. Matla, on the other hand, is a short tidal channel that makes a quick pass through the mangrove forests of Sundarbans before merging with the Bay of Bengal. So access to the sea is quick and easy. The British also conclude that Matla will be easier to navigate. Its streams are deep enough everywhere that the largest ships can easily sail in and out without having to wait for the water levels to rise high enough. So, it was decided a new port and town would come up at the head of the river Matla. A committee was set up. The river and its surrounding areas were surveyed. And in 1853, the government bought and marked the land where they would set up this new port. It would be named Port Canning after Lord Canning, the former Governor-General of India, then the Viceroy. Soon, forests were cleared. Wharfs were built. A canal was designed. Roads were carved out. The town was planned. While some land would be agriculture, land along the west bank of the Matla River was portioned into town lots. Rights to these town lots were sold at a public auction for a term of 60 years. There was a lot of buzz around this new town and most of these lots got quickly bought up for about 8 rupees to 20 rupees per bigha per annum. In 1862, the Port Canning Municipality was set up. Then a Port Canning Company was established. The company's goal was to purchase and reclaim more land bordering the river Matla. A railway line was also built connecting Canning and Calcutta. Basically, Port Canning was promoted as the next big thing as the next bustling trade centre of the British, one that would rival Calcutta. This was in the mid-1860s. But let's go back to 1853, when the British government was still ruminating on the idea of this new flashy port and town, when the committee was being set up and surveys of the Matla River were just beginning. That same year, an Englishman named Henry Piddington wrote a letter to James Andrew, the then Governor-General of India. I'll come to the letter, but first a little bit about Piddington, who frankly, based on what I've read, 
sounds like a very interesting guy. Henry Piddington was born in 1797 in England. His father ran an inn, sort of a hotel, and for some reason, maybe because he frequently encountered sailors who visited that inn, Piddington developed an interest in life at sea. So, he became a sailor, then a commander of a ship, and he traveled the seas of China and East India for many years. But in his 30s, he decided to settle down on land and he picked Calcutta. Once on land, he went on to do many non-sailor things, like holding the post of secretary of the Agriculture and Horticultural Society. He became the curator of the Museum of Economic Geology in Calcutta, and he also became the coroner of Calcutta. You know, the people who investigate suspicious causes of death. And he didn't just hold these posts for the sake of holding posts. He studied things deeply and he wrote books, very detailed books on things like minerals and geology, agriculture and plants of India, and he enjoyed writing long letters. There's one that he addressed to European soldiers about why and how they should switch from drinking alcohol to drinking coffee. He was a huge coffee fan. But the thing that he's most well known for is his study of storms. While he was a sailor, Piddington had been caught in a few storms himself, and he was fascinated by them. Scientists before him had already done some legwork. They had identified what makes a storm a storm. How a storm is basically a traveling system of wind circulating around a calm center, that it moves anti-clockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. Now Piddington was not a scientist by training, but he had practical experience of being a sailor and of being stuck in storms. So he read up all that he could on the signs of storms that had been figured out until then. He also got other sea captains to send him their ship logs whenever they encountered storms. and he dove deep into every well reported storm that had occurred in seas near and far not just that he also examined reports of famous storm disasters that had taken place even before his birth in 1797 and with all this knowledge that he gathered he wrote several papers and books including the sailor's horn book the book wasn't just a theory of storm signs but it explained how sailors could easily identify storms while at sea how they could deal with those storms if they got caught in one and how they could take advantage of the properties of storms to stay safe and on course he also included these transparent storm cards in his book which sailors could use to track the movements of storms while sailing these were eventually called piddington's horn cards and they were used by sailors far and wide if you haven't heard of these cards or any of his books that i mentioned you're not alone But there's one Piddington contribution I'm sure you are all very familiar with. Piddington coined the word cyclone. So the next time you hear of any cyclone, think of Henry Piddington, a man of many talents. Now, at the time when Piddington was publishing all these writings on storms, it became well known that in tropical sea waters, cyclones were a major problem for sailors. But Piddington wasn't just interested in storms at sea. He was particularly intrigued by how cyclones that start at sea go on to impact land. And so in books and papers, he began hammering in the idea that cyclonic storms could cause storm surges. That is, they could push the sea water to form a massive wall of wave that moved towards land. This storm wave, as he called it, had the potential to then cause huge destruction once it made landfall. I know we've digressed a bit. So let's get back to 1853. Port Canning. The British government is getting ready to build this new shiny port and town that will rival Calcutta. But even before any construction has begun, Piddington is very worried. In September 1853, He writes a letter to the then Governor General of India, James Andrew. In that letter, through very meticulous reasoning based on geology, evidence of past settlements in the region, and a detailed history of storms and the destruction they've caused there, Piddington tries to convince the Governor General not to build the port and town. This is what he writes, paraphrased slightly. By reviewing all facts, I confess that I have been unable to bring my mind to any other conclusion than this. 
that if the Matla River is chosen as a port and town, everything and everyone must be prepared to see a day when in the middle of the horrors of a hurricane, they will find a terrific mass of salt water rolling in or rising upon them. This will happen with such rapidity that in just a few minutes, the whole settlement will be inundated to a depth of from 5 to 15 feet. This may not occur for the next 5 years or for the next 20 years, but it may also occur in the next month of October, or it may happen in May or June of 1854. These views, he says, are not based merely on theory, but on what he calls sound scientific and logical deduction from authentic data. And he urges the Governor-General to not make the mistake of building Port Canning. Of course, no one stopped constructing the port or town because of him. Just like governments rarely stop a big project because one or a few scientists warned that it could be disastrous. It'll start getting cooler. I you, wish, just, you just watch. I wish science agreed with you. <laughs> hey, well, I don't think science knows, actually. Tom, please. No. Mr. President. Sadly, Piddington died in 1858. So he didn't see that Port Canning continued to get built, that people moved into the town and started farming and settling in. But the excitement did not last long. Piddington's prophecy came true. On November 1st, 1867, a devastating cyclone passed over Port Canning. This wasn't surprising. There had been cyclones before. But this time, the cyclone pushed a massive storm wave that passed over the town with quote-unquote, fearful violence. In some parts of the river, the water rose to six feet above flood levels, and the storm wave destroyed everything in its path. Not just that, the seawater also caused great damage to crops and reduced the amount of land that could be cultivated in the future. All probably because the Port Canning Company had cleared a lot of the mangroves that may have otherwise blunted the cyclone's impact on land. Piddington cyclone had come just a few years after the town and port were beginning to take shape. And this cyclone was a huge setback. One that brought focus to all the other problems that had already started cropping up. The Matla River, for example, like Hooghly, also seemed to be silting up. And fewer ships were actually docking at Canning than what the British had predicted. On 16th of September, 1871, the Times of India had a small article titled The Collapse of Port Canning. In it, they reported that only two ships had docked at Canning the past two years, of which one was an unwilling visitor, driven there by the stress of weather. So, the Port Canning Company was facing huge losses. And among the many reasons for it was its choice of location for the port. Despite warnings that the location was a prime target for cyclones, and that the impacts of a cyclone could be much greater once you removed the first line of defence, the mangroves. In 1871, the government decided to close Port Canning and withdraw all harbour establishments. The only thing they left behind was a small ship that would serve as a light source to other ships navigating through the region. the port canning project had turned out to be an utter failure. All that exists of that ambitious project now is a crumbling building called the Canning House. Now taken over by a chaotic web of creepers. This episode was created and hosted by me, Shreya Das Gupta. 
Theme music, editing, sound design and mixing is by Abhijit Shailanath. Research and writing assistance from Nihira Ram and editing help from Abhishek Madan. With this, we end the three-part mini-series on homes and climate change. This 10th episode is also the end of season 2 of Imagined Tomorrow. Yes, it's over for now. And I'm so glad that this time we had Abhijit to join us on this journey. His brilliant sound design really brought the stories to life. We are all independent creators. And so if you enjoyed what you heard so far and want to show your support, it would be great if you could give us a shout out on social media. We would love that. For now, it's time to say goodbye. Thank you again for listening.